Tonight, we're answering, what does the Bible say about the end times? Uh, And I wanna sit here for a moment, and it might be a little bit awkward, but I want you to sit here and think about what the term end times actually means to you. Like when you hear that phrase, end times, like what comes to mind? Like it might be the rapture, or it might be, you know, trials and tribulations, or it might be, uh, it might be Jesus coming back, right? And like what that looks like. You may have questions about when or how or what, who. All of these questions are great questions, but I would honestly be like mistaken if I didn't tell us how to live as we wait for that. Because I could sit up here and I could go through all the theological intricacies, all the little details, all the little theories and perspectives. But at the end of the day, as the church, we have a call to live like faithful people regardless of how or when or why the end times happens. Like we really, like it matters, but it also doesn't matter because if we know, like it really should not change the way that we're living our lives right? Like if the, if the world ended tomorrow, if Jesus came back tomorrow, if I told you right now you had 24 hours left before Jesus came back, would the way that you live your life, would it change? Would you still serve? Would you still show up to church? Would you still be obedient to your parents, to your teachers? Would you even go to school? And tonight we're gonna talk about how to live like faithful people, how to live like people where if we knew the end of the world was coming, we would not have to change what we're doing. So we're gonna be in 1 Thessalonians 5 tonight. We're gonna kind of dissect almost the entire chapter. So you can go ahead and flip it there. Because if we are to live like faithful people, we are gonna need a hope bigger than ourselves. Like if we're really gonna obey the word of God, if we're really gonna live like faithful people, we need to live with a hope that is bigger than ourselves. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verses one, and we'll read till verse eight. It says, now as to the times in the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And while they, this would be non-believers, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child and they will not escape. But you brethren are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief for you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So point number one tonight, how to live like faithful people. If we are going to do that, we have to live sober-minded. We have to live sober-minded. Because this word says Christians are of light, right? And Rand's kind of touched on this last week, and I actually kind of touched on this two weeks ago. It was kind of hidden in the message. But we are people of light because why? Christ is light. He is light. In him there is no darkness. So if we are to be his followers, then there should be no darkness in us. We are of light, we live on mission. To do that, we have to be what? Awake, we have to be sober. We have to be aware of how we are living, how we are walking and aware of our surroundings and where of the world. But those who are not of light, those of the dark, those who are apathetic, who don't walk with Christ, they are like sleepy people, right? And they will be overcome in the day of the Lord, like a thief in the night, like a woman with labor pains. I don't know, actually, I do know that none of you guys have probably had a child, so um, you probably don't know what labor pains like, but let me tell you, they are inevitable and they are unpredictable, which means that they will happen and we don't know when. So like 
the day of the Lord, like the day when Jesus comes back, it will be inevitable. He is coming back. If you did not know, Jesus is coming back. There is over 2,000 verses in this book that tell of him coming back. And they are unpredictable. So we cannot know when he is coming back. Therefore, we have to live faithfully. So we live of light. We live on mission, awake and sober. And our faith, love, and hope, they strengthen us and protect us for the trials, for the doubts, for the suffering, and they give us confidence in our impending deliverance. The Lord will come back and deliver us. And until that day, it is our faith and our love. It says that faith and love is like a breastplate, a breastplate that protects us, right? Like a warrior would wear a breastplate as armor. And then the helmet, the hope of salvation. Our hope is in our salvation. Our hope is in Christ. Sinners, those non-believers, those who live in the world, those who live in the darkness, whatever you wanna call them, they are short-minded. They are 70, 80-year minded. Their hope is in themselves. Their hope is in man. Their hope is in the world. But the faithful are eternity-minded. 1 Thessalonians 5, we'll pick up in verse 9. For God has not appointed us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, this is speaking literally, we will live together with him. Therefore, comfort one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. But we ask of you, brothers, that you know those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, and see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Point number two, if we are to live like faithful people, we have to live at peace with one another. One of the things that grinds my gears the most about the church today is that we are so hyper fixated on those theological perspectives, on those theological interests. Like when is the Lord coming back and how is he coming back? And you will see Christians like legitimately beefing with one another, like hatefully beefing with one another about is the rapture real? Is the rapture fake? How is the Lord coming back? And then on and on, like not even end times related, but anything when we talk about the word of God. And to some degree that is good, right? We should be edifying each other. The, the word says that we should admonish one another and encourage and help. But it also says to seek which is good and to live in peace. Like we, so many Christians get caught up in bickering with one another about the how and the why that we are not living in peace because the Christian life is not meant to be lived alone. That's why we gather. We need edifying community. Like we cannot do this life alone. We definitely cannot live like faithful people alone. And I think that we need to return to a culture of deep community, community that holds each other accountable, that edifies each other, that submits to one each other, and that truly, like truly loves each other. Faithful people will seek the good in those around them, especially within the church, especially within this body. Like how many of us come here every single Wednesday, but we don't know another person in this room right now that comes here every single Wednesday? Like how many of us don't know our brothers and sisters around us in the room right now? This is community. Like we're looking at community. God put you here. He didn't put you in another room. He put you here. He gave you these people to do life with for a reason. And it is for all of our good, should we live at peace with one each other? Should we love each other? Should we encourage one another? Should we edify one another? Should we build each other up? Faithful people seek the good in those around them. Second Peter 1, verse four. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature 
having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith and in your knowledge, sorry, in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in whom these things are not present, that person is blind, being nearsighted, having forgotten the purification from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and choosing sure. For in doing these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, that's kind of a mouthful, but there's two things I wanna pull out of there, right? When we, when we look at applying diligence, it is a journey that leads us to love. It is a journey that leads us to godliness and out of our godliness, brotherly kindness, out of our brotherly kindness, love. And then later on it says that in, it says that in these things, if they are yours and if they are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the full knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but the last thing I want to be is useless and unfruitful. Like we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but if we are living lives that are useless and unfruitful, then we're wasting our time here. Like to really lean in and to really get out of what we're doing here, it would be to be useful and fruitful. It would be to live at peace with one another, to have brotherly kindness and to have love. And it says, and for doing these things, you will never never stumble and for in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly applied to you. I wanna be sure in my ways knowing that I have a home in that eternal kingdom. When I think about the end times, I want to know with surety that I have a home in the eternal kingdom. I don't wanna wonder how it's gonna happen because I want to be sure of my fate. I want to be sure of my eternity. Useful and fruitful people are diligent in their lives, both individually and communally. They're fruitful, they are useful, and they have a home in the eternal kingdom. First Thessalonians 5, we'll pick up in 16. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, but examine all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be persevered completely. Without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, faithful is he who calls you and faithful is he who will do it. Psalm 1, I love this psalm. It says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and in his law he meditates day and night. In his law, he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season and its leaves never wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. For the wicked are not so, but they are chaff-like, and the wind drives them away. Therefore, the wicked will not rise in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for Yahweh knows the way of the righteous but the way of the wicked will perish. Point number three, 
If we are to live like faithful people, we have to live in his presence. We have to be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. We have to meditate on his law day and night. Our delight should be in him, in his law, in his word. We have been given a gift. Do you meditate on this day and night? Do you meditate and spend time with the Lord day and night? Are you living, like not coming in and going out, are you living in his presence? Everywhere you go, his presence is faithful to follow you. Because everything is an outpouring of where our mind is. Just like the Olympic racer, right? If you are gonna train for an Olympic race, if you're, whether it's a sprint or a marathon, you will do everything you can every single day to win that race. That race will dictate how you spend every day of your life for years and years. And if we look to the eternal kingdom, if we look and we desperately seek the Lord in his return, that we would spend eternity with him, it will begin to show every single day of our lives. Second Timothy four, it says, Paul says, this is at the end of Paul's ministry. He says, I have fought the good fight and I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to also all who have loved his appearing. His appearing, that he will come that he will save, that he will deliver us, that he will make us a home, that he will lay up crowns in heaven, in the eternal kingdom, that there would be no more suffering, that there would be no more pain, that there would be no more doubt, that there would be no more insecurity. But we would spend eternity with them. How reassuring is this? How reassuring is this that if we fight the good fight and we keep the course, there are crowns of righteousness waiting for us. That our hope does not have to be in the world, that our hope does not have to be in an election, that our hope does not have to be in a girlfriend or a boyfriend or our parents or a sports team or even a church. But our hope is in one God the Father who is over all and through all and in all, the Father that desperately wants to know you, to live with you, to seek your heart and to spend eternity with you. You will live a totally different life if you live eternally minded than if you would living 70 to 80 year minded. You will live a totally different life if you have a hope bigger than yourself. I am victim, I am guilty, not a victim, I am guilty of making lifelong plans. Like you can ask Reagan, I am the worst at making plans, at making goals, at making like just these insane visions that will never come to pass. Like I really held on to the dream of being an MLB player until I was like a senior in high school. Like, there was clearly no path for me. But everything shifts, like every single thing shifts. When your hope is not in yourself, when your hope is not in what you will accomplish in this life, when your hope is not in those people around you, our community is such a blessing. It's edifying, it's crucial to our lives but it will amount to nothing if our hope is not in he who is and was and is to come. And Jesus is coming back for his bride. Luke 18, eight, it begs the question, I have loved this verse. Luke 18, it's, a, it's really a parable, but this specific question, it just, it begs the question, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will he find faithful people? Will you be living like faithful people? 
And will your hope be in him? Will he find people living sober-minded, living at peace with others, living in his presence? Those are the people, those are the people that he is coming for. And I don't, I don't wanna like stray into the technicalities, can we lose our salvation, all that, but like why even go there? Why do we even have to draw those lines? Like why? We should have surety in our faith. We should have surety that we are living faithfully, that we are following the way, that we are following this book and living for Christ. When you lay your head down at night, if Christ came back in the middle of the night, like, do you have surety? And it's not to say that life will be easy. In fact, biblically, the end times doesn't really, doesn't fare well for us, at least in the short term, right? Like we look and we read things like the trials and the tribulations and the seals and, and we will experience suffering, whether, in, whether Jesus comes back in our lifetime or not. As Christians, we will experience suffering, but the Christian answer to the problem of suffering is that we have something worth suffering for. Why? Because our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is in Christ who already defeated death, who stole the keys, who rolled away the stone and gave us the hope of salvation. Second Timothy two, last verse, it says, it is a trustworthy saying, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If, but if we will deny him, he will deny us. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny faithfulness. So will you live faithfully? And if we died with him, we will also live with him. And if we endure, we will also reign with him. There are crowns of righteousness if we live faithfully, if we endure, if we can run the race with endurance and stand before God on that day and say, Lord, I don't deserve to be here, but you saved me. And he would say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Everything we experience, all the suffering, all the trials, the dying to self, the picking up our cross, those things that are hard for us to do as Christians, they are worth it. They bring us joy and fulfillment if our hope is in something bigger than ourselves. We have hope in Jesus. And we look to him, the author and perfecter of our faith and ask that he would come and unite us with him so that we can behold him face to face for eternity, eternity. Like not 80 years, maybe a hundred, eternity. Tonight, you came in here with your hope in something. You came in here with your hope in maybe yourselves. I've been there. Maybe your hope is in your parents or in your teachers or in your coaches or in your teammates or in your friends or your boyfriend or girlfriend. Whatever that may be, let me tell you that there is greater hope there is hope that will never perish. There is hope that lasts for eternity. There is no greater hope than he who was and is and is to come. He is coming for his people. Will you be faithful? Will you live faithfully? Will you live kingdom-minded, eternally-minded, with eyes on the Savior.
Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for this night. I thank you for your word, your perfect word. Lord, I thank you for a community. I thank you for each and every person in this room, whether it's their first time or hundredth time. You brought them here for a reason. You are speaking to them. You are working in them. You are working through them. And you are offering hope that is greater than anything they could measure up to you. Lord, we thank you that you are coming back, that you are not leaving us and forsaking us, but you are returning for your bride. You are returning for your people. And what an honor it is, what an honor it is that we would be invited to the celebration, the celebration and the marriage of the lamb and his church. Lord, your heart is for us. Your heart is with us. You've given us hope in the midst of suffering. You've given us hope in the midst of doubt. You've given us hope in the midst of trials, in the midst of broken relationships and broken families and insecurities and lies and schemes. And there is nothing we could go through that you have not defeated, that you have not overcome. And therefore, there is no greater hope than you. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, I pray that you would transform our hearts, transform our lives to live completely and totally abandoned to you. fully open to how you want to use us, fully open to where you will lead us, to what you are doing. You are sovereign, you are creator. You're the king of kings, Lord of lords. To us, that might not mean much, but that is such a great title. Like, I pray that we would never lose our awe and wonder for who you are and for what you've done. And Lord, if we can never comprehend, Lord, give us grace, give us love, and allow us to look forward to that day where we can look at you face to face and lay in your arms and share in glory, share in righteousness, for we ran the race with endurance. I thank you that you give us endurance, that you give us hope and you love us so much that you would die on a cross for our eternity. I pray these things in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen.